There's a universe inside each of us. The Innerverse Podcast is your portal to that infinite realm of ideas. I'm Chance Garten, and I'll be your host as we serve up inspirational sound waves from the brightest minds with the highest vibes. And we keep searching for the empowering perspectives we need to create our greatest masterpiece of all, our lives. Welcome to the one within all back to the universe. This recording is coming at you from October 19th, 2019, and I can't wait to spark the conversation we're about to have with electro mystic and digital dream weaver Evan Bartholomew, known online and at music festivals nationwide as Blue Tech. As a sound sculptor, pixel pusher and meaning maker, Evan crafts ambient and atmospheric audioscapes with a fantasy sci fi feel and psychedelic artwork that points your perspective towards the path of infinite possibilities. Blue Tech explores a universe of styles from down-tempo, space disco, electro, dub house, glitch hop, and more, but its originality begets a unique experience that no genre can prepare you for. With album titles such as Dreaming Into Being, Love Songs to the Source, and The Four Horsemen of the Electrocalypse, Blue Tech's vast discography might just be the next soundtrack in the movie about your path to enlightenment. Evan is here to talk about the intellectual aesthetics invoked by his newest sonic offering to the Internet Altar, an album called Holotrope. Described as a movement towards wholeness in four parts, Holotrope respects the matrix of four architecture of reality in its four-part structure, unfolding through metaphorical movements of descending, expanding, ascending, and integrating, reimagining the steps of the psychedelic experience of self-realization in a musical mode. Evan lists holotropic breathwork, meditation, lucid dreaming, and shamanic journeys through the imaginal realms as inspiration for the music, and I'm pretty excited to hear more about these fascinating practices from the man himself. Holotrope came out near the beginning of October, and you can stream it on SoundCloud and Bandcamp right now by checking out the show notes for links to Blue Text pages. So with introductions behind us, it's time for another turn of the podcast wheel with this phenomenal producer and dedicated diver into the deepest realms of consciousness. Let's welcome Evan Bartholomew and his Blue Tech persona to the show with some grateful comments on social media, or at very least, some warm and fuzzy astral appreciation lasers from your heart for his first time on the show with us. Evan, my man, thanks for being here and welcome to the Interverse. Thank you so much for having me. That was the best introduction ever. <laughs> will you will you write my marketing documents now, man? I, I slave over like how do I talk about this record without being arrogant and sounding pompous? And no matter what I do, it still ends up sounding arrogant and pompous. So much better if you wrote them, <laughs> dude. I know what you mean. I love to hype other people, but self promotion is like it feels weird. But I've had friends that make music ask me to do that before. I'm I'm not against the idea. It's it comes naturally to me. But uh, let's talk about you though. Hey, um, introduce yourself. You know, my flowery words are one thing, but how would you describe the person you are? For years, I've been trying to figure out if I'm a geek, a dork, or a nerd, and I think I finally settled on a triangulation of all three and can fit somewhere in all of those overlapping worlds. That sounds good. I'm pretty much the same. As you in that sense, I uh, really like to overlap my interests because I think that even if you're not even if you're into something and you're not nerdy about it, uh, you're missing out on the way that it connects to everything else in the universe. Like all paths are expressions of the same thing in a different I guess, configuration. So we, yeah, I, I've, I've always said there's only one room, but there are man, a lot of different doorways into that room. People get, <laughs> people get obsessed describing the, you know, length and breadth of the doorway and how fancy the, the, the architecture of the doorway is. And I'm, I'm much more interested in just opening the door and walking through and seeing what's on the other side. I totally, man. I love that metaphor too. Sometimes in like, extreme psychedelic experiences, breakthrough experiences I've had, it's felt like the entire cosmos condensed itself down just to the people that I was in the room with, if that makes sense. And in a way, that's kind of the holographic nature of reality is your the the boundaries of your universe are the perception boundaries. So like there's a big you're, that's why we feel so different in nature rather than, you know, in a small room. Well, we can only ever perceive 
the the depth of the universe available to our our sense organs. So yeah, you can perceive the whole universe, but it's your whole universe. I, I would never uh, deign to claim that I'm experiencing the totality of something through my senses that is so much more vast than my senses. Yeah. And then there's a whole another range of senses that are yet to be unlocked in humanity that are kind of lying dormant. And some of the th themes that you describe for the album Holotrope definitely uh, tie into that concept and notion and and how inner sight can show us a, a much more expanded and holistic view of what consciousness and eternity really are man it's it's amazing even just a rudimentary meditation practice like no no additional uh plant allies or anything else just sitting in silent meditation if you give yourself to that practice like i guarantee you you will have very, very fantastic metaphysical experiences that cannot be explained by normal scientific rationalist thinking. And I say that from personal experience, like simply sitting with your eyes closed, like for me, it doesn't take very long before I can see through my eyelids or see from perspectives outside of my body or see through the back of my head, like awareness of the room and scientific rationalism does not explain that. And it's a very simple, simple experiment. People can try Like give yourself to meditation for a few weeks, see what happens. Dude, you're so right. That actually makes me think of something that happened to me last night. I was laying in bed, the lights were off and I had my eyes closed, but I could see the outline of like the ceiling fan and the dresser and all the furniture in my bedroom. And for a moment I was like, are my eyes open or closed? I had to think about it. Because I thought that I was just seeing in the darkness with my eyes adjusting to the light. It was pretty trippy. And that's that's definitely something that's come out of an awareness practice like meditation for myself that it's kind of common. It's become it's so common now, like part of part of holotrope for me is like looking at the universals of consciousness experience when you begin to explore the inner worlds. Right. So. For me, it's beginning to make a map when I sit down to meditation. Okay, what happens? Okay, you know, mm, scattered brain, monkey mind running around, bouncing off the walls. Okay, cool. Then I've established a certain degree of focus. Okay, after focus for a while, it's literally like the inside of my eyelids becomes an inner dome that expands to a certain amount of space. And then like one of the steps along that path is, okay, cool. Now I can see through my eyelids like focus back on what is in the inner worlds rather than getting lost and tripping out on the fact that I can see through my eyes to the world around me. And I mean, it, for me, it's like, it's a very linear step of like, these are the different phases of consciousness I go through as I descend into inner awareness. And it's funny too, if you get hung up on the powers that come out of it, then it like stops the progress at that point. <laughs> That's actually a huge part of traditional meditation practices and why you're not supposed to seek after the powers is because they can become a hindrance to stream entry and the higher levels of consciousness, except consciousness accessible through contemplative practice. Yeah. It's like with the, the desire to claim some power or special ability, it's like, you must have a reason for wanting to be able to do that. And well, your, your roadblock is in the first word of that sentence. And that's desire. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That is the roadblock because it's like, that desire is coming out of a need to control something and the power of the universe only flows through trust essentially. And so you'll be granted what you need in the moment you need it. That's that, that's, that is ego, which is locked into time and space. If you're desiring, then that automatically is setting up a belief system that you lack something that you want, which is a hundred percent, the domain of the ego, the, power of meditation and contemplative practice and psychedelic experience and ceremony and ritual is literally disconnecting the ego stranglehold over your sense awareness and beginning to find that connectivity to everything outside of time, all things existing in totality in the present moment. So even the desire to have that experience becomes a roadblock to that experience, which is, it's a real like paradigm shifter in the brain when you begin to realize that thinking about thinking is causing the problem or desiring to not think is keeping you from not thinking so that you can have these expanded awarenesses. It's, it's really a, a practice, man. It's, it's a, yeah, it's the, the disconnecting of the ego from control of awareness is not only the most challenging 
process, but it's amazing how it still asserts itself even as you get deeper into the practice. Yeah. And the practice changes too. And that's something that's been interesting to me lately is I kind of fell out of the habit for a little while due to thinking, well, this isn't the way it used to be. I'm not experiencing sort of like visionary stuff the way that I was before in meditation. And I, but I talked to a really, uh, really knowledgeable yogini about this and described how meditation was going for me and how I felt a little more rooted in my body and like aware of my body, but I couldn't get into the more psychic elements of the meditation. And she was like, well, actually, and another way of looking at it would be that's more advanced because you're more present and not distracted by stuff that's not literally there. So I was like, that's kind of cool. I do feel like I have a lot better body awareness than ever. So maybe it's I love I love that you started that thought with I fell out of practice by thinking and I was yeah. going to say, just stop. Do you not say anything else right there? I fell out of practice because of thinking. It doesn't matter what the thinking is. And it's amazing. Like I will be in a place where literally I'm like floating in infinite space. I feel like my consciousness is expanding in all directions. And I start thinking about where to go next. And that's when I lose it. Yeah. And it's, it is, it's almost like a daydream when you're in that space, you're, you're just not really holding on to it, but you're also paying attention to it in this perfect balance. And then there's always the fun, weird things that occur during meditation. Like a couple of days ago, I was in the middle of it. And all of a sudden I saw this vision of like an old hag, like kind of ugly, older, witchy type of creature. And right as I saw it and just sort of like accepted it and didn't really judge it or think about it anyway, I was just seeing it. I felt this whoosh of air go out of my ear. And then the, yeah. the image vanished. And I was like, I'm not going to bother interpreting that, but it was weird. <laughs> I've, I've been a big fan of, um, do you know who Daniel Ingram is? No. Daniel Ingram is somebody you should definitely look up. He, he wrote a book called Mastering the Core Teachings of the Buddha and runs an online community called uh, Dharma Overground, which describes themselves as an unusually frank uh, discussions about the Dharma. So things that teachers and, and more traditional paths won't tell you, like really specific, fundamental nuts and bolts. This is what meditation is like. These are the steps the consciousness goes through. Here's a map of the sine wave of awareness. Here's what happens when you experience a peak event. You will then have a downswing of negative emotions and doubting your practice. Like, And so the, commun the discussions on the Dharma Overground like really get into those specifics of like, hey, I felt a buzzing feeling and then this happened and really practical like advice on how to navigate these different states of consciousness and awareness that come up. Specifically, he wrote a short book with Shannon Stein uh, called The Fire Casino Practice, which has been the focus of my meditation practice for a while. And I think that URL is firecasino.org. We should definitely add it to the show notes. But these people will sit in uh, meditation for 10 day retreats. And then they, they literally turn on a recording device at the end of the retreat and answer questions and talk about their process. So hearing from people that are like fresh out of that space and willing to document the journey for others, I find to be exceptionally informative and has helped me progress faster of like, Oh, right, right, right. Like when you see the black dot or, you know, when this particular, uh, you know, TV static experience happens, like here's how to, to keep awareness and not get lost in it and, and pulled off, off of course, uh, firecasino.org and Dharma overground are the websites that should be linked. Man. Yeah. I'm, I'm definitely going to check that out and, and link it. And, uh, mastering the core teachings of the Buddha, uh, second edition for, uh, available for free online has a full map of the steps from basic meditation into stream entry slash what some people would refer to as enlightenment. Like basically these are the verifiable repeatable stages of consciousness that one goes through. And it's so helpful to recognize where you are on the map and be like, okay, cool. And like have, have some awareness of what is next. Man, can you expand on that term stream entry? Because that is a really interesting one. Have you not heard that term before? No, not in reference to like uh, entering the flow state. So, uh, yeah, so I'm at looking, uh, Satipana in Buddhism is stream entry. This is right from Wikipedia, uh, meaning stream winner, stream entrant, a person who has seen the Dharma and consequently has dropped the first three fetters that 
bind a being to rebirth, namely self-view, clinging to rites and rituals, and skeptical indecision. It literally means one who enters the stream. So in Buddhism, it's it's like the first stage of enlightenment. Uh, oftentimes, we think that enlightenment is like an event that happens once. Literally, quote unquote enlightenment, the first entry into the stream is is the first of four stages of enlightenment. So. Daniel Ingram, these guys that are talking very frankly about that stuff, like have achieved different stages along this path. Um, and, and we'll talk about it and how, how to get there, how to, uh, maintain the state when you arrive and, and what it looks like on the other side of it. That's really interesting. And I'm definitely going to check this author out because you mentioned sort of like the sine wave peak experience and then dip into negative emotions. That's something that happened to me earlier this year. I had some kind of like Kundalini crazy experience where it was like being on heavy psychedelics all out of nowhere without being on them. And it lasted for an entire day. And uh, that, that experience can, can last 15 seconds. It can last 10 months. He calls it the A and P the arising and passing away. It's a very seeing through the eyelids is a big sign of an A&P experience that Kundalini rising shock of finger plugged into a light socket energy up the spine is a very clear sign of A&P. And, and this, when I'm talking about them being very frank about it, there's like a whole chapter on the arising and passing away. And like, this is kind of what it looks like. And after that shit gets a little dark for a while, man. And that's a repeatable cycle that will happen many times. Dude, that's my experience, actually. Like, I I had that. And then I actually had to choose to end the experience because I couldn't, like, function with uh, what I was trying to do in, like, 3D meat space very easily. So I had, like, it wasn't going to end until I lowered the vibe myself. It was really, really weird. And then I went through, like, a return to some bad habits and uh, self-doubt type of thoughts and just a smorgasbord of returning to neg negative things I had already seemed to have progressed past. Yeah. So arising and passing away is considered the fourth stage in this whole cycle. Time distortions, powers, visuals, sleep effects, physical effects, moods, sexuality, like you tend to get like super sexually active after a, a A&P experience for a while. It's often when people are like, I'm going to run off to, you know, Tibet for six months. Like you have this, this, uh, yeah. You, you have this kind of push and then and then there's there's a dark side to it. And it's very, 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 very consistent. Uh, this this path of insight that uh, after the arising passing away is literally what they call the entrance to the dark night, the dark night of the soul. Then you go through fear phases. Then you have misery. Then you have disgust. You want to give up the practice. You want desire for deliverance, reobservation. And then equanimity, when you come back to a place of peace and re-enter the practice without all the negative emotions, which the peak experience for me, the holotropic breathwork session, which inspired the holotrop album, like had very, very specific A&P effects. And then I had some really dark times after that, man, where I, I thought I was having a nervous breakdown, dealing with anxiety. You know, it took, it took me a bit to, to integrate which is why i was very clear about the integration stage when writing that record is you have you have that peak that as ascendant peak and then you have to integrate it and the 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 ego doesn't want to let go the the dominant paradigm worldview that we're raised in that we're meat beings and meat space and time is fundamentally linear and progressive at a, a consistent rate like all of these things begin to be called into question when you experience meditation and experience these deeper levels of awareness. And it takes a while for the self or what we think is the self and the ego to, to re balance itself with new data is I guess the easiest way to say it. So the more that we have those peak experiences, the harder, the harder sometimes the fall is on the other side, the more we have to integrate them and, and until it becomes a practice of understanding that, oh, right, okay, that's what that is. I'm at this stage. And when you understand that, then, then the dark night, the, the swing of the sine wave down before it comes back to center equanimity maybe can be lessened because you're aware of it and you know that it's there. And your focus then becomes like 
to continue practice, to continue focus on awareness and the breath and to ride through and allow all those negative emotions and the things that are released by opening the door to express themselves and come back into balance. Man, that definitely sounds like kind of what happened for me. Well, during the experience itself, the peak part, basically the way I was perceiving reality was like one of those Google deep dream images where it was just this green nature fractal. And then whatever person or thing I focused on would like emerge to me through the fractal, even though I was like maybe moving towards it in physical world. It was so strange. And uh, <laughs> it felt like I was in like a digital interface of some kind. But then after the experience, I ended up having to come to grips with what was like an unrecognized but deep-seated and long-held fear that was maybe one of my biggest fears and then experiencing the thing I was afraid of happening and it not being a big deal at all. <laughs> yeah, for me, the the last big peak experience like that, I was, uh, this was, I mean, the whole tropic experience was one for sure, which kind of opened the door. And so the, the kind of peak positive part of that continued for a while. I had a downswing and then I had another peak again before really kind of uh, coming to terms with it. And for me, I was in a tent uh, at a friend's place in Northern Idaho and um, was meditating, fell asleep and woke up as the sun peeked through the trees into the window of the tent and that light on my eyes, like this golden, this flowing liquid, sparkling, multidimensional gold was filling everything. Even when I opened my eyes and I continued for a couple hours, this, this experience of this like infinite molten gold, which if you read the fire casino website about some of these different layers of things, like they talk about the molten gold, like, so for me, it was very powerful to read other people being like, Oh yeah, yeah. There's the gold that tends to be like, you know, like this. And then there's the white gold experience. Like, it, there's a community of people documenting these very specific states of awareness. So for me, that was the last big A and P experience in August of this year of experiencing this like literally molten, like shimmering with prismatic sparkles. And it was like physically real, like moving like lava gold that when I opened my eyes, I could see it underlying the nature of reality and the physical objects in front of me and what I was experiencing, which was intense and beautiful. And then, wow, damn, it hurt on the other side, man. Yeah. It's like when you come back from that, it does make everything, uh, it doesn't, sometimes it can make reality seem more shaky. Cause I know I've had other peak experiences. This was just the most, like, I guess on the natch one I've ever had, but, uh, the other side, you know, if things aren't a little shaky and uncertain in your reality, then I, I don't know what else to call it because you realize how delicate the balance of everything is based on the energy that you're putting into it. And it's like, shit, now I've got to be real about the responsibility I have for my dharmic experience and uh, the way I interact with the the collective. Yeah. Yeah. And again, like getting caught up on the specifics of that experience and like, oh, the, you know, the molten gold is real or this particular experience is real, again, is keeping you from moving through it to the next place. Like, yeah, it's easier to treat everything as symbolism and interpret it the way that you would a fiction in an English class. That's what I've always done. I mean, the, the trick really is to like, just observe, observe, don't, don't attach, don't, uh, don't try to create meaning for the self that isn't there, just experience without judgment, without, uh, without the ego turning you into some like avatar and starting your own cult, like just have the experience and realize that it's as elusive and as essentially empty as the rest of the experience of being a human in space and time, which really the, the scariest part about meditation and why it's such a practice and challenge is that everything you think you know about the nature of reality and the nature of self begins to dissolve the, the deeper you look inside, including the construct of self of I am blank begins to become not so uh, set in stone as you thought it was. Yeah. The essential emptiness of things is, it's uh, the coolest paradox that the universe is built on that the only way you can have everything is from nothingness or or that you can't have nothingness because that concept even requires a something to conceptualize it. 
in and, the first and place. That's, and that's not like deep occult metaphysics. Look at the nature of matter. Like it's dark matter matters. It's mostly empty. Everything is. It's the fundamental nature of reality is emptiness. Yeah, I mean, the the wall in front of me, the molecules are so spaced out, it could be like as as uh, distant as stars It's yeah. in, at its scale. So, and that's another way of understanding what it means for something to be of, of another dimension or interdimensional is that we're talking about dimensions of scale, not like, so not even not anything much more mystical than that. We're just, like, we, we are literally cells in another dimensional scale, just like our cells make up a body at, at a different scale. I love I love one of the metaphors in uh, the mystical Kabbalistic tradition about us each being cells in the body of the Adam Kadmon, which is literally like the reflection of God looking back at God, this being that is each each cell in that body is us. Yeah, I think that's a pretty apt metaphor, too. And I like how you have a variety of occult and spiritual and metaphysical interests, because I'm the same way. I think you've delved further into Buddhism than I have. And I'm really excited to check out this more uh, Frank Dharma discussion that you're talking about. Yeah, but, I really haven't uh, delved that deep. I don't want to pretend like I'm a, um, a master or know anything about anything. Just of course. The, the actual <laughs> technical nuts and bolts, functional, like, oh, you close your eyes, this happens. If you focus on a candle flame consistently and do the practice, then this is going to happen. You will see a red dot after the red dot fades. You will see a black dot after the black dot fades. You will enter what we call the Merc. And in the Merc is the doorways into other three dimensional worlds and astral travel and all these things. And here are a hundred modern, you know, well-rounded individuals doing this practice and then reporting back about like, Oh yeah, that's how it goes. And then you try it yourself and you're like, oh yeah, okay, cool. These are, these are verifiable states of being. And it's stripped kind of the, like Buddhism always seemed so uh, impenetrable to me, just all of the, you know, the, the wheel of this and this deity and all of that. And then underneath it though is, is a really practical map from people that mapped it out over a couple thousand years of like, this is what works. If you do this, then this will happen. Here's, here's what that map looks like. So I'm very thankful to Daniel Ingram and, and his community of people that are stripping the religion out and, and taking a real directed, logical Western brained approach to the practice of exploring consciousness. What I love about your music is it carries that in the actual music like this this is something you would have seen more often in the past, like when people had less to do, but your album is the type to put on headphones and like lay down and go through the whole journey with your eyes closed and experience a real journey. Like always been an album guy. Like I hate that we've moved into a single culture. I hate that now um, the industry is such that shorter songs rate better on algorithms than longer songs. So people, artists are actually shortening their composition process to chart better on Spotify and have the playlist rankings work in their favor, which to me is just the most terrible thing ever. Yeah. When art is made to satisfy the public instead of made to as an expression of the authentic desire of the artist, it always goes sideways. <laughs> I mean, that's, it's the, the perpetual challenge of like music industry is uh, how to be fresh with music when you're getting, or music business, I should say, how to keep the business out of the music so that you can make music. And I have the, the incredible honor of being represented by a team of really talented people, including Holly that, you know, that, keep my world going so that I can do what I need to do, which is be creative. Yeah. And it's gotta be nice to have a team to work with though. I, I can relate to how the business side of trying to launch something as a vocational creative pursuit is like 
you know, you don't, you don't even want to get into certain nitty gritty things. You just want to do like, I just want to have these conversations. Sometimes I don't want to edit and produce the show, or I don't want to post it on social media. I just want to like go have the next chat or maybe do some other form of our not, not podcasting, but so it requires that type of a grind at a certain point. And it's cool that you have been able to expand your network by pursuing your path to the point where you've got people like Holly, who's been a guest on the show before and Holly Harper. She's a amazing singer and instrumentalist for glass cannon and does awesome work for many artists like yourself, keeping them uh, connected to their fan bases through the social media work. She does really cool. And it's super rad human. Yeah. I, I uh, got to catch her band or her and her, Husband, Casey, because they're just a duo now. They were playing at Backwoods right after the insane tragedy of the helicopter crash. And I don't think anybody could have captured the the joy and sorrow of that moment in a better balance than she did. It was really cool. Yeah, I, I totally believe that she my experience of her is that not only is she talented and great at her job, but she's very like soulful and connected to people around her. Yeah, I'm glad we took a little detour to uh, <laughs> sing her praises because she's, the, she's yeah. the shit. <laughs> but hey, let's talk more about uh, Blue Tech stuff. Like, what what's the uh, rest of the year shaping up for you? Like, looking like you've got any interesting events to speak of? Uh, I mean, I've got a lot of events happening right now. Uh, we're like, officially on tour for uh, yeah. I got a couple days at home and then. Um, and flying out Thursday, Thursday, Durango, Friday, Denver, Saturday, Kansas City, Sunday is uh, Fayetteville, Arkansas this week. So, oh, um, wow. Yeah, it's, it's, it's been, yeah, it's been pretty full on about halfway through the tour. And then uh, this year for me will end with Cosmic Convergence uh, New Year's in Guatemala. Oh, man. Yeah, I've been hearing really great things about that. And yeah, uh, I went and had a really good time. I'm excited to go back. Cool. Do you get to go out of get to South America or out of the country for, for gigs that often? Uh, I, yeah, I, I get a fair amount of international gigs. Actually. I had, I had, uh, Amster, uh outside of Amsterdam, a uh, festival called sci-fi in September of this year. That's exciting, man. I love that. Looking forward to getting a little more mobility in my life and traveling because I can take this anywhere technically, that'd be cool. But, but awesome. And to return to talking about holotrope a little more, I think what interested me the most in our conversation was how many ways this whole matrix of four idea is reflected in uh, the ex meditation experiences you're describing and like the, em the enlightenment steps. And then in the four phases of, the journey that the album takes and that's reflected in the four seasons and there's four base elements in Western occultism. And there's so many ways that you can uh, find this duality and polarity, how the yin has a spot of yang in it and the yang has a spot of yin in it and in, in all manifestations. I mean, I didn't, I didn't specifically like look at four from the metaphysical perspective of like, you know, four elements, four directions. Although of course, you know, that's an awareness for me. Um, it came down to the practicality of like, okay, this is definitely a double album. Uh, it'll fit on four sides of vinyl. So there's four movements. So, and you had the four <laughs> horsemen too, though. I do have the four horsemen. Well, but that was a thing. The four horsemen are a thing. All right. <laughs> yeah. But also another kind of uh, just reflection too, of how in a lot of, Mytho mythological cultures for even has a connotation of representing death because of the completion element involved. Mm. And it used to be thought of as an unlucky number in East Eastern countries. Interesting. Well, what other modalities do you like to explore? I, I mean, if you're into meditation, there could be some other interesting topics that you, you like, maybe divination practices. Uh, you've talked about Kabbalah a little bit uh, where, where other where are other interests of yours lying? I mean, I, I always, I've always had a fascination with what I call man's yearning for the divine. And that's the part of the human experience where we want, we want meaning, we want purpose, we want 
to feel that there's something larger than ourselves. And I don't care whether you're, you know, deeply atheistic or deeply religious, there is a part of, of the human psyche, whether it's cultural or genetic, I don't know, but there is a part of the human psyche that seeks communion with something bigger than the self. So for me, the beauty of mysticism and poetry and religion and ritual is, again, each of them is this beautiful doorway into a space. And the the space itself is the goal, but I, I find appreciation in the infinite variety and differences in the different doorways to enter that experience. Yeah, I, I, I do too. That's why I like to do what I'm doing here is to explore a million different ways that someone can find ultimately what I feel that we're seeking on a basic level is to, as you were talking about entering the stream, just the flow state itself where you can be relaxed, but active and, you know, uh, what do you call it? The Wu way, right? Um, trying without trying and just dancing is the perfect example of it. When you lose yourself in a crowd at dancing to music very much like your, your own can do you, your body will move almost on its own accord, but your intention can still guide it. And there's a very, there's a very noticeable shift when you go from not, I won't call you awkward, but you might feel awkward, like awkward dancing of uh, unsure about yourself kind of jerking around versus just going for it and not thinking at all. And it's all, it is back to the not thinking thing ultimately. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's the same for writing music for me. It's the same for marathon training and specifically race day for sure. Um, just kidding. I mean, we're always thinking, right? The, the power for me of contemplative practice is that you begin to realize that there's a whole field of awareness that is much more wide than the part that's locked into the act of thinking. So for me, meditation, I actually talked about this in a, a video podcast I just did with my friend Valerie about using traffic as a, an opportunity to practice mindfulness. For me, running also, so it is a huge thing uh, when I am in, I run half marathon. So for me, it's, it's usually around mile seven, eight or nine where it starts to get really hard. And I start counting my breaths, uh, count up to 30. When I'm counting up to 30, I'm focused on pushing my muscles. As I count from 30 back to one, I'm focusing on relaxing them, allowing oxygen to move through my body. And I have found that, man, it puts me into a deep, deep meditative flow trance state and I begin to feel like I'm just floating over the concrete and it, you know at that, that point it's it's physically challenging to finish the race but it, it becomes this deeply peaceful zen like state for me of of just being with my breath being with the awareness of my body including the pain in my body and just riding that current through as much as possible that's sweet know. Remind me, remind me where we were going, why, why I used that as an example to... Uh, well, we're just kind of talking about the flow state and you just oh, yeah. simplified once again why anything can really lead you to the flow state. Marathon running doesn't seem spiritual on the surface, but I guarantee that the very most elite distance runners will probably tell you, yeah, I've had out-of-body experiences while I was running. It happens all the time. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's deeply... Um, for me, running is deeply... Med- Meditative. Whenever I first was taught meditation, it actually helped me get myself back into shape after having been out of shape because all of a sudden I could handle going on jogs and running on a treadmill or doing something that required focused, consistent endurance. Where before the monkey mind would always just tell me, no, I can't do this or no, I don't want to do this so loudly that I would just be like, I'm, I'm not doing it. You see, and the, and the power there is... When you begin to realize like that experience is totally defined by your belief about that experience. When you tell yourself like, actually, that's how the, the counting to 30 started. When I would hit, hit a wall and be like, I can't go anymore. I'm tired. This sucks. I, I would tell myself, okay, I'm going to count 30 breaths. If I still feel this way at the end of 30 breaths, then I'm allowed to stop. So the practice of counting 30 breaths, like 
getting peaceful again, usually you get your second wind or your 18th wind, depending how long you're running. And sometimes I would get to 30, still feel like crap and be like, well, I'll just count 30 more breaths. And the process of slowly counting 30 breaths, like you just did, you know, a quarter mile or whatever. And then you're like, oh, well, you know, I only got a half mile left. I might as well just finish this run. So yeah, the, the practice of meditation has definitely helped me. I mean, I lost 75 pounds, 80 pounds by getting into running and body stuff and, and mind practice. This has been the key to my success in being able to race like that and run like that consistently. Wow. Congrats. Congratulations. I actually lost 80 or 100 pounds at one point in my early 20s, and it was right after learning meditation. I didn't even have to put on too much exercise to lose it. It was like just releasing the energy trapped in those cycling thoughts was what let a lot of the physical energy of my body go. That's super cool, man. I wanted to ask you uh, how how long you've been uh, producing electronic music? Cause you have a huge discography. Uh, what were you always aware that this is the direction you wanted to go? Or was there an aha moment? Uh, I mean, I actually started with classical music. So as a kid, I, I didn't even really discover popular music until the top gun soundtrack. <laughs> really <laughs> um, listened to pretty much exclusively classical as a kid. And uh, started classical piano and, you know, very involved in that world. Um, and I, I would hear things like television commercials. I think that, that Axel F song, whatever that was from the top end soundtrack, like I would, I would hear synth, synth sounds, I guess, and be like, that's it. That's the music I'm looking for. And, and coming from basically, I used to dream these musical soundscapes and they had this particular sound. And when I would hear synthesizer music, I, I, identified that that's what I was looking for. So, you know, fast forward, high school, skinny puppy, ministry, industrial, et cetera. The, the rave scene is starting to take hold in the States. And, and for me, it was that first wave of chill out music. So Irresistible Force, The Orb, uh, Space Time Continuum, Ultramarine, Higher Intelligence Agency, Aphex Twin stuff was all coming out. And I was like, this is it. This is the music I've been looking for my whole life. So, um, yeah, I, I I traveled around a bit. I got into the side trance scene. I was DJing, and and when I finally got around to like, okay, cool, I need to start producing music. Um, it, it was uh, oh god, ninety nine, two thousand, uh, two thousand was when I got serious about it. Well, it it definitely has paid off, I think, because at this point you're creating these high concept albums that are my very favorite type of thing to listen to where the journey of it actually reflects the spiritual journey and spiritual progress of the creator. And all art is meaningful and reflective like that, but the self work that you've been doing is definitely coming through in the quality of the experience that I, I get out of. I, I mean, I just discovered your stuff this year, I think possibly thanks to Holly and it's been it's been great. I, I you listen to it, exercising, working like one of the things that um, you mentioned, classical music. That's always been a, a a flow state inducer for me if I'm trying to focus in, and get through some sort of like mentally intensive work or on a computer. And uh, your blue tech stuff actually has a similar effect to me as classical music with, while still being this digital thing. So yeah. that's that's pretty interesting that it mirrors your background there. I mean, so for me, like why classical music was so powerful as a kid, like I can remember climbing behind my parents' big hi-fi unit with my headphones on and listening to Mozart and Beethoven and like, you know, the first strings would swell and, and in my mind's eye, the landscape would would come into view and each of these like movements of, of the music would create objects that I could fly around and observe. And I think that those early experiences kind of tuning my brain to music as this audiovisual astral travelogue has kind of stuck with me when I write. Like when I am in the process of making music, that's that's what I'm pointing towards is music that creates worlds, I guess. So yeah. synesthesia is a, yeah. another word for that. That's amazing. I like to ask music producers too if uh they it, what their more frequent process is like hearing music in their head and then trying to translate that into parts on the screen or shuffling around 
things on the screen until it starts to take a shape that you like. Because there's kind of two ways about it. You can do the almost collage method of putting things together and and then whittling them down. Or then you could also start from an entirely conceptual movement in your own mind. I mean, the, the, it's crazy that I have, you know, this career making these kind of expansive soundtrack type of things. And, and for me now, the, a bigger challenge is, is being more direct. And I'm, I'm like, I feel like I set the bar with holotrope that I, I can't follow up holotrope with another concept album like that. Like it's not, it's not where my, my muse wants to go figuring out how to take that sense of otherworldliness and uh, time dilation and expansive prismatic multidimensional experience and compress it into a shorter pop structure is not the word, but a, a more direct compositional take is, is the, the new record that I feel kind of bubbling up from the surface. Interesting. I, I uh, have a similar thing with my artwork is the further I develop up my personal style, the more I want to focus on the less is more thing and see what I can do with like refining the chaos down into more and more pure <laughs> concepts. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. That's awesome, man. Well, I'm excited to hear what comes next. You're extremely prolific. Like how many releases did you have just this year? I mean, in, in the calendar year, I've had four original record. Uh, oh, wait, is it four? Uh, Behind the Sky collaboration with uh, In the Branches, Liquid Geometries, Sci-Fi Lullabies, Holotrope, and I, I guess I had a final um, had a final Horseman EP in there. So that's five releases this year. We can wrap this up and tell everyone where to find you online and um what how to how you like to connect with them if there's a certain way that works best there there is actually that's that's a kind of big part of this last year is i uh, started a facebook group called blue tech dreamers which is a place where people will share dreams and art and music and talk about life and spirituality and it's it's kind of become my weird favorite pocket of the internet because of of how gentle and friendly and kind and inspirational it is with, with the community of people there. So that's where I actually kind of hang out. If you want to have a conversation with me, starting, starting a topic there is, is gonna, gonna, I'm going to see it and comment on it. If it, if it's something that I feel like I have, have uh, words to offer to. Yeah, man, I'm in that group myself. It is a cool group of cats. <laughs> awesome. Thanks for hanging out with us, dude. This has been a good chat and I'm excited to expose some people to your new album and hope uh hope to hear more from you and keep keep on not thinking too much <laughs> right yeah I, I feel like i'm just getting started man so we'll see we'll see how many records come out of me in the next year but the, the floodgates are definitely open at this point yeah that but then there's also that whole thing where you can't allow past prolificness to like pressure you into i don't I haven't touched touched uh haven't even turned on my keyboards and since holotrope was finished uh i know again it's that sine wave cycle so peaked with with the holotrope creative process i'm in the downswing which is when i go on tour when i have a couple days at home from tour i watch movies play video games hang out with my dog go see my friends like not even beginning to push myself toward productivity because I know that if I wait till the flow is there, that it'll come out the way it's supposed to. Yeah, I, I just went through that with the podcast. I had like a couple week period where I just didn't care to uh, schedule a lot and do a lot of work. And then right now I'm in this like having interviews every day phase and it's just flowing easily and quickly. So I, I definitely see the wisdom in respecting those cycles and I'm going to do my best to pay attention to them and myself too. And I'm glad that you're able to bring bring some light to that for the audience. I think that's really, really profound use of uh, your reflective capacities on your own journey to maximize the enjoyment and minimize the suffering. <laughs> 18 years of making records has taught me that after every creative process, there's always a downswing. I call it the postpartum. Once you birth that creative baby, you gotta, you gotta take some time to heal and you know restock the batteries and, and do all the stuff, so. 
now I just plan for it. Okay, cool. Well, I'm going to be quiet for these couple months. That's my time, which again, you know, I'm, I'm a couple weeks left of tour. I feel that new record starting to bubble up and I'm just like holding space until I have the time to spend a week in the studio without having to get on a plane and start, start sketching out those ideas and let them come through. Awesome, man. Well, and you guys watch out for Blue Tech coming somewhere near you or to a festival near you. And thanks for being here with us, Evan. This was awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. That's another podcast on the books. Thank you, Blue Tech. I guess I mean Evan. It throws me off to uh, have people have an artist name, and that's what I'm used to thinking of them as. In reality, it's kind of like a persona, and they're actually a regular person with a human name. <laughs> so yeah, thanks, Evan, for bringing the human behind Blue Tech to our ears today, because it was a really fascinating conversation. I especially appreciated. Everything regarding intellectual aesthetics and the metaphysical escapades that led him to create the album in the way that he did, or at least this new album. And I do hope you guys check out Holotrope. That's going to be linked in the show notes, along with every other cool thing that Evan mentioned and asked me to link, like the Deconstructing Yourself podcast and a couple of the episodes he mentioned there and the book he talked about. All around, I got all the links in the show notes there, and you can find them at your personal leisure. (laughs) And no plus extension today. I honestly just didn't have the time to create that long of content this time around. And as much as I want to have podcasts coming out all the time, I appreciate something that came up in this episode, which was that when you have a big creative birthing, that you have a little postpartum (laughs) recovery, depression period, whatever you want to call it. And with podcasting, you don't quite get that, at least if depending on how your cycle goes or your, uh, your flow state. Like if you're trying to put out a weekly thing, well, you're not the same human week to week. And maybe uh, in a monthly or seasonal fashion, you do come back around to high energy and low energy type of feelings. But yeah, it's it's a little weird. I'm getting the hang of it. Even though I've been doing it a long time, like, like three years, I'm still getting the hang of how to stay in a full time flow state with the show. So With life things that come up, you just never know when all of a sudden you're going to be more busy dealing with things that you've got to deal with for survival or just basic human life upkeep. For example, I had to put a roof on my house today, (laughs) this weekend, actually. I didn't physically put the roof on, but there were sky people up there on the roof scaring the pets in my house and stomping around. And that makes a lot of noise. And it meant that I couldn't even record this outro till later in the day. So that's not to be making excuses. I know you plus people really like the extensions and would like to have them, but no worries. There'll be a lot more coming soon. And if you're not a plus member, do remember that there's like 70 plus extended episodes in the Interverse archive that you can check out by subscribing on Patreon for five bucks a month. You get the two hour version instead of the one hour version of the show. And you also help me have more time, energy and finances to make this a better thing. And You'd also give me a nice little boost and help remind me that there's some good people out there in the world that actually care about conscious content and kind of get what I'm trying to do here, I guess, and are with me on it. Not with me like 
following me blindly or I'm not even trying to put out any one particular message. I, I just like to expose everyone to all the ideas that I personally enjoy exploring. But I, I guess where I'm going with this is there's a weird situation that I feel compelled to bring up and address, even maybe in brief, not in full. What's been going on that's tripping me out the last couple of days is like a stalker, man. <laughs> I don't know how else to put it. it it's so weird. I, I guess it comes with the territory of becoming a more public figure. But there was someone that was on the show a while back who I guess had a stalker type person that was obsessed with them in an unhealthy way that is, you know, basically unreasonable. It makes no sense. <laughs> and this person, because they were on my podcast, their stalker decided to target me for a while. And the main reason I'm even bringing it up, other than the fact that it just weirds me out to be told I'm going to bleed and I'm going to be hurt or killed over something that never happened. And I, it's, you know, it's a fantasy in someone's delusion world. What's weirder still, though, that really freaks me out is that the person went around direct messaging people that follow me on Instagram, random people from all over the place. I have no idea how many, possibly hundreds and telling them a bunch of untrue, weird stuff about me. And I think luckily anybody that got one of those messages could tell, wow, this sounds like it's coming from a completely unhinged, kind of like loony person. And not that I don't have love for this individual that's doing what they're doing. It's just not fun to go through being targeted by a bunch of like slanderous lies and having to receive messages from random people for a couple of days saying, Hey, I got this message about you. What's going on with this? And <laughs> because uh, I would have been just as happy to keep my mind on fun and cool stuff. And it a little bit goes back to what we talked about in this episode. I apologize to you, Evan, for if you're listening to this outro right now, that I'm even having to bring up this weird scenario on the show that you were a part of. But in a way, it ties in because what causes this type of like weird, obsessive behavior has to do with desire. And we talked about desire and the pitfalls of desire in this episode quite a bit. And while I don't necessarily go all the way to the view that all desire is to be like eventually conquered or abolished, because I think that it also is the force that puts the universe in motion and makes things happen. And there's a lot of good things that come out of following things that you desire. It's just a balanced thing. And if you get so caught up on desiring just one thing that no other thing or person or status or whatever could ever be good enough or satisfy you or let you be happy, then you get into some weird places. If you have desire to do something more general, like improve yourself as a human being, <laughs> be kinder, whatever, things that are open-ended and that could happen in a myriad of ways, those are good kinds of desires because they're like fuel. They're fuel for your sales. As long as you're not so invested in that desire that failing to attain the perfect version of whatever it is that you're imagining will bum you out or make you go crazy, then you're in good shape. I think the desired thing has a lot going for it, but we do need these mindfulness practices to be able to, I don't know, not control our desires, but temper them with a detachment that is healthy. You know, it, it's all about being in the world and not of it at the same time, I guess, like being in the Dharma, following your path, but also realizing that whatever your destiny has in store for you is going to involve a whole bunch of shit that you didn't plan on, didn't expect, and might not have at first thought you wanted to choose. But going further down the line, there's always a reason why everything did unfold the way it did. And we can be happy about even the tough stuff later on. I'm sure in a few years, I won't be even slightly bothered by how freaky the whole uh, internet harassment thing is. <laughs> later, I'll just probably laugh about it because it'll be long past. And I'll also have learned a valuable lesson, hopefully about how to deal with this type of situation. I don't know. It's one of those things where I don't even know where the lesson's at for me in it in the moment, but it'll come, it'll integrate in its own way. That's just part of it. Uh, I did learn the lesson that Instagram doesn't do shit as a company. If you report somebody for harassment or bullying, even when lots of people report the person, they just send me a message that said, oh, that profile does not meet the criteria for harassment, even though they're like, you know, 
saying slanderous, untrue things and making death threats. It's pretty whack. But enough of that. I had to get it off my chest. It, it's not really easy to bring it up. It actually caused me to stall producing the end of this episode for quite a while because I was like, I want to talk about it, especially because someone might have seen one of these messages directed at them that they never sent to me and they never found a resolution on. If you're listening now and you got one of those weird, <laughs> creepy slander direct messages, now you know. And I can let it go completely. Water under the bridge or whatever. Bury this. Bury this and um, be done with it. Assuming the person continues not bothering me anymore. <laughs> and uh, yeah, watch out for each other out there. Not everybody is the same level of love and light, it turns out. And there's reasons for that that are cultural or societal. But at the end of the day, we all got to make our own choices about who we're going to be in the world. No matter the chemical balance in our bodies and brains, we still have a consciousness and a mind that is something beyond the physical. And I think Blue Tech or Evan in this conversation here gave us a lot of interesting clues about what those beyond states might feel like and be like. And ultimately, the desire thing, going back to it, there is a truth in there that whenever you attain higher states or astral travel type of experiences, higher states of consciousness, you do have to just not even hold on to the thing. You can't really like try to clinch the experience and define it and make it be what you want it to be, or even attempt to understand it. Sometimes in the more subtle experiences that we can have, especially in meditation or astral travel, just looking at it and observing it for what it is without making judgments is all you can do to keep the flow state going. And I think that's a pretty safe strategy for life as well, up until the point where you got to make choices about where you're going and what you're going to do you know, we could all go meditate in a cave for 30 years and that's the majority of our life or we could live out our dharmas and be in the world. I think it's good to have one foot in both shoes, <laughs> if you will. And I think that's all I got to say for today. I guess I'm going to play us out with some blue tech music from Holotrope, a couple of my favorite songs on there, although it's hard to pick because they're pretty much all good and it's a journey. So I don't like taking a piece out of the journey without giving you the whole thing but hey if you want to hear the whole double album it's on soundcloud and it's linked in the show notes and thanks for being with me everybody appreciate you sticking around to the end and hearing me <laughs> deflate this weird vibe about the scenario that i had to bring up and thanks again evan for coming on the show thanks holly for putting us in touch love you all and see you next week got a fun episode coming up next with the Cosmic Keys podcast co-hosts Dan and Scarlett. And we already had the chat. It was phenomenal. Looking forward to getting it to you in about seven days. Until then, much love. Bye-bye. <laughs>